Welcome to the continuation of our Iron Ada Accelerated Character Creation Series, everyone. It's just me today, but I do have some important announcements for everyone before we begin. First up, we have just about one more week left of the Akatacon 2019 Kickstarter. If you plan to be there at all, now is the time to get your tickets. If you can't go but have a cool thing to advertise like a podcast or an RPG, think about sponsoring a table. Or perhaps you can just spare a few dollars to sponsor a game for the games library. Or just be a friend of the con and throw a couple bucks its way. Every little bit helps, uh, so it would be awesome if you could help make this absolutely amazing convention a reality. I know it's one of my favorite conventions of the year, so I hope to be able to go again this year to meet more amazing people and to be able to spend some actual time with them throughout the weekend. Um, every single Akatacon that I've gone to for the last couple of years uh, has just been remarkable. And the people that I've met there, I count as uh, some really, really great friends. And honestly, it couldn't have happened without people back in the Kickstarters before the the convention uh, even got off the ground. So um, please back the Kickstarter if you can. Uh, and if you're planning to go, go ahead and back the Kickstarter because uh, you're going to need tickets one way or the other. And if the Kickstarter doesn't fund, well, then nobody can go. And that would be sad. Another announcement is that we are accepting questions throughout the year now. Uh, once we have enough questions, we'll throw together another Q&A episode, since it seemed to go over well last time, uh, and we enjoy doing it. So you can go to questions.charactercreationcast.com to ask us pretty much anything you'd like, uh, and we'll answer it if, as long as it's appropriate. <laughs> And in lieu of no Amelia this week, uh, we will be skipping the review. But if you'd like to help us out, please submit a rating or a review on Apple Podcasts using the iTunes app. We know it's a bit of a difficult program to wrestle with, especially in regards to rating and reviewing podcasts. But every rating and review moves us, moves us up in the rankings a bit more and helps other people discover the podcast, which grows our community of amazing people even more. Uh, you can also leave a review on the likes of Podchaser, Stitcher, and even our Facebook page, and we will read them out on the air whenever we are both able to record these together. So go ahead and send them in, and we will queue them up. And that's all for now. So let's go ahead and get on with the show. Enjoy. episode, Tracy, Amelia, and myself were creating our holdfast. We had to find three out of four problems for the community, and we're just about to figure out what the last problem meant. We're picking up right where we left off last time. Enjoy. So generally in this world that you've built, the thing that instigated this problem with the mm -hmm. dwarves is because of the bone bonded because of the giants or is that no, like an ongoing no. thing that we um the dwarves just attacked cool um the dwarves were the ragnarok but the ragnarok that no one expected mm -hmm. okay yeah and the bone bonded were a response to that okay. and it's all loki's fault yeah well, that checks out yep all of it <laughs> thanks loki <laughs> mm -hmm. um okay so i'm sorry what was your question again why did they attack yeah why did why did the dwarves attack in such mm -hmm. numbers, because to, to give a little bit of frame of reference, um, the massive 50 foot tall destroyers, there's usually one or two of them in, in a hold fast attack. They're accompanied by six or seven foot tall automatons that a person can face one on one. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then 
countless numbers of dwarven spiders, which are um, about a foot or two in diameter, and they have nine legs, each of which have nine joints. Ooh. So if you have a spider thing, they're really creepy. <laughs> uh-huh. um, and the question says that there are many dwarven automatons. Yeah. There, there are usually two automatons per destroyer, so either something was different about this attack just to the, that there were more automatons, or there were also more destroyers accompanying them somehow. So this was a lot coming at you is the point. That's interesting. So, so why? Can you read the full question? Because I feel like there's yeah. a part that I maybe want to... Okay. The twisted wreckage of many dwarven automatons surround your holdfast. Why did the dwarves attack in such numbers? And how did the Bone Bonded defeat so many of the Dwarven War Machines? Okay, so it says the Bone Bonded. It mm-hmm. does not say how many of them. No. Do we nope. have more than one? I want to say yes. Okay. And that's why they, like, brought the big guns. I think, yeah. Oh, so your holdfast is known for... Yeah. Yeah. I think having multiple Bone Bonded probably is just completely rare, probably. Mm -hmm. And having uh, at least a group of them, like five to ten. Oh, my gosh. um, Would really light the flare for the dwarves Mm -hmm. to say, we need to take this place down. Are we like the capital holdfast? We're like the holdfastest holdfast. (laughs) (laughs) The superlative. You you definitely could be. Um, either that, or you just have a bunch of people who have bought into the idea of the bone mm-hmm. bonded, despite despite what it means. <gasps> Do we have a sweet bone bonded cult? So <laughs> there is a rumored there's a rumored tenth clan. Ooh, the clan of the bone. We got this. Things this got is good. interesting. Okay. Did it. Clan of <laughs> Bone Stronghold. Got it. Yep. Yep. Uh, and I have a suggestion for that last part of the question. Please. So Ryan said five to ten bone bonded. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I think those were the rumors. I think the Holdfast actually had five. Okay. Until the dwarves attacked. And then they bonded five more people. Ooh. That's how they defeated so many of the dwarves. As the attack was coming, whatever ritual is needed to bond someone to the bones of dead giants, which is left vague on purpose, yeah. five more people pulled the spirits of dead giants from the lightless void to whence they were consigned and bound those giants to their very beings. Wow. Yep. Yeah, I like that. Okay. That's metal. Uh-huh. <laughs> I'm so excited for this. Uh-huh. <laughs> I love this already. Yes. All right. So they won because five more people took the bone bond. Mm-hmm. And to represent this on the uh, on our map here, I think we need like a spot where that is sacred to the clan of bone, right? It's where the bonding ritual takes place. Yeah. Um, should that be inside the walls or outside? I think we need something inside. Yeah, I think inside the walls makes the most sense. Okay, then um, going to do this real quick. Let's make a little face, and we will color the face dark purple. And wow, the mouth disappears when you color it dark purple. That's not creepy <laughs> at all. Now, now it looks like, um, uh, what, Baymax? A little aw. bit? Yeah, it really does. <laughs> it's a purple Baymax. And Aww. we will label that Clan of Bone. Okay. Um, the last thing that we need to do before we move on to the characters is we have to name the Holdfast. Uh, there is guidance for this in the book because, as I have heard you all say a number of times, names are hard. Yeah. <laughs> I have, a, um, I have a, a ridiculous. I did, I did name, my homework. But... What do you have? <laughs> Bone fast. <laughs> yes. Um, that's that's good. Um, the suffixes uh, for hold fast. Just so you know, if you want to to change, because yes. bone fast is absolutely fine. Um, but the uh, uh, heim h e i m means home, uh, lund means land, and borg means city or town. Mm. Uh, so bone heim would be bone home. Ooh. Bone Borg. Yeah, I like Bone Borg. Bone Borg, it yes. is done. Um, it sounds like the Swedish and, chef, but that's fine. <laughs> well, so I there's also <laughs> there's a there's a link in the game that says if you want a an authentic Old Norse name, use the translator at blah blah blah. Uh, I'm gonna call that up real quick and say uh, English to Old Norse, search Bone, 
uh, the old Norse word for bone is bane, B-E-I-N. So baneborg, does that sound good or do you want to go with boneborg? I like baneborg. I like baneborg. Mm -hmm. Okay. Baneborg. Bone down. Uh, Yep. (laughs) Why is it not letting me edit this box? Oh, because there was a second box on top of it. There's a second invisible box. (laughs) There we go. So now we have Baneborg. And I always find myself slipping into a possibly bad Norwegian accent when I say these names. But this is our hold fast of Baneborg. I love it. Okay. Uh, Next, we have to make our characters. Yes. Let's make some people. Uh, You all have had a chance to look over the archetypes. Uh, For those who are listening, I'm going to read down Uh, the archetypes real quick and give a quick idea of what they can do. Um, So um, in alphabetical order, because that's how I see them, uh, we have the bandit. Uh, The bandit actually gets to make a gang and uh, their powers all rest upon scores. So if they have made a score recently, they are flush and can do a lot, right? Because they have goods or information to work with. When that is tapped out, they are reliant upon the community on which they prey. Ooh. Because medieval bandits were very feast or famine, mm-hmm. and without a population center to prey upon, they would quickly not make it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I wanted to reference that. Uh, then we have the bone bonded. Uh, as part of making a bone bonded, you actually make your giant, and you give them a high concept and a worldly desire aspect in addition to making your own character. Nice. Uh, you have a crafter who is exactly what it says on the tin. Uh, The crafter can make masterwork items uh, with rarity. Uh, Basically, they make a lot of advantages and pass and hand those off to people in the forms of, like, equipment. Nice. Um, We have the farmer uh, who actually creates a farm and a crop or thing you raise on the farm. And when the farmer fights in defense of their home or the holdfast where their farm is, they attack at a higher level of scale or they defend it so that they can defend bigger threats when they're defending their home. Interesting. Uh Uh-huh. Uh, we have the leader, which does not have to be the Jarl of the holdfast. It can just be a leader figure. Mm -hmm. We have a merchant, pretty self-explanatory the merchant though um is very good about uh taking on debts so the merchant can owe a lot of people favors Mm -hmm. uh we have the rune scribed there are 24 runes of power one of them can be inscribed upon your body uh, via tattoo branding or any other metal uh thing you can think of and when you use your runic power your approaches for a scene operate at a higher level of scale Uh, and we'll talk about scale when we go a little bit later but um, we have the seer. Uh, seer magic is accomplished by manipulating uh, the strands of fate. And uh, the basically, a seer makes big, powerful aspects that manipulate things. But fictionally, if a seer is using magic to divert a river, they don't reach out with power and move the river. They reach back in time and pluck the strand of fate that would have a pebble fall that had the trickle that became the river divert to a new path. That is amazing. (laughs) It's a lot of fun. (laughs) Um, I'm realizing that I don't have a uh, pre-made one for the priest, Mm -hmm. uh, but there is a priest uh, who actually adheres to a specific God's cult and has to like, follow their rituals like the kind of thing that clerics and D are supposed to do but games rarely if ever enforce mm-hmm. um because it's challenging in that context um we have a shield bearer who is uh, a warrior from world of warcraft okay they're a tank they're a tank that draws aggro mm-hmm. and they don't have the usual ways of mitigating stress uh which is fates analog to hit points sort of um they instead have a track a condition called i can outlast you when they would be taken out they mark a box of that they clear all their stress boxes just minus one Hmm. and so they can take hit after hit after hit until they get a last glorious stand uh when they go down in battle interesting um and then there's the scald uh who is all about gathering information and rumors has um a power called a uh, a word in the right ear is the seer's power. Oh, yeah. The seer can also make anyone in a position of authority do exactly what they say. Nice. Um, d- but just once. Uh, and if they do it too much, they are noticed from manipulating fate. <laughs> um, but scalds are, are, are bards, right? The tellers of mm-hmm. tales, um, gatherers of information and secrets. Awesome. So those are our archetypes. So excited. 
um, and you all can play anything you want. Um, I had a game uh, that I ran on a Twitch stream to promote the Kickstarter, excuse me, the Kickstarter, where all three players were seers. Oh, nice. And literally by chance, all the questions they rolled were the category political maneuvers. Huh. Ooh. And they were all the same block of six questions. Oh, that's amazing. <sighs> but they rolled three different questions. That's so good. <laughs> it was wonderful. <laughs> so, Ryan and Amelia... Who do you want to be? Oh, I, okay. I I was be- <laughs> I was between a few, um, okay. because uh, of course a lot of them caught my eye. Um, uh-huh. But I got to be part of that ten. I need to be. I, I need, yeah, I want you to. I need to be a. I don't want to play. I don't want to pick the same thing that I did last uh-huh. time. So I think that I want that for you. Yeah, I got to be a bone bonded. Okay, Ryan, you're going to be a bone yes. bonded. Wonderful. Um, so on our uh, third. Uh, slide here. Uh, like I said, just for easy reference, I'm going to just in parenthesis next to the the name here on the first one. I'm just going to put bone bonded. Cool. So we know we'll use that for for your stats. Um, and by the way, as, as an aside, uh, I made I titled this one character creation cast hold fast. So you all can share this link. We'll just we'll, we'll make it non editable after we're done. Nice. Ooh, awesome. Um, and you can share this as part of the, the stuff. Oh, that's amazing, yes. Um, so ev- everyone can see how the tool works. Cool. Amelia, who do you want to be? I think that I want to do Rune Scribed. Ooh. Awesome. Okay. And I think, hmm, given everything that we have going on here, I'm going to be a seer. Ooh. Okay. Wonderful. So let me pop open the... Runescribed sheet so I can see uh, Amelia's stuff and I'll pop open the seer for myself. All right. So the first thing that we do when we're making characters and we do all these steps together, so we're all sort of on the same the same page. If you look at the second page of the character sheet, uh, you will see your aspects are there on the left side. Uh, in Iron Edit Accelerated, all five aspects have a type to them because uh, I found it was much easier to uh, have that information be right there. So to give a quick overview before we dive into the aspects, uh, the folks at home need to know what these characters can do. So, uh, Ryan. Yes. Uh, do you have your uh, your bone bonded sheet open there? I do. Okay, would you read to the people uh, what your conditions are? There. Um, they are described on the third page. Conditions. Okay. Yeah. So it has, um, okay. So if I'm reading this correctly, it has, uh, check boxes and one's checked next to bone bound. Mm-hmm. Yes. Uh, that one's not described on the quick start sheet, uh, because it, it basically means, Hey, you're bound to a giant mm-hmm. and it, you can, it is always marked unless some major magic unbinds you from your giant. Ooh, that'd be bad. Right. Okay. Uh, so then, uh, what are your other three conditions? Uh, so then I have um, summon the bones. Mm-hmm. Um, you operate at giant scale. Mm-hmm. Um, and abomination. Uh, you are outcast. Um, and out of control. The giant takes over. Yeah. So those are the short versions. Uh, mm-hmm. On the third page in that text box, you have the actual... Ooh. condition language yeah uh so you can see what they all do mm-hmm. um you act the wording on the sheet is a little incorrect you actually only have three boxes uh to represent your control over the dead giant bound to your spirit yes um uh would you like me to summarize those uh, it's a lot yeah, of reading so i don't want to okay uh so for some of the bones you mark a box and you summon the bones the giant rises up out of the ground when the rib cage hits where you are you rise up with it and your body becomes limbed in a fire the color of your choosing Nice. Uh, and you pick it once, and it's always that color. Okay. You get to operate at giant scale for a whole scene. That's amazing. Okay. You recover those boxes by indul- indulging in your giant's worldly desire. Uh, if your boxes are all marked, and you wish to operate at giant scale anyway, you can mark the out-of-control condition to do so. Oof. If you want to recover all your boxes at once, you can mark the abomination condition. Okay. Um, if you are out of control... 
you can do it when you, when you're using when all your boxes are marked and you want to summon the bones, or when the GM says so, mm-hmm. be, because there are uh, special circumstances. The giant inside of your inside of you takes com- control of your body for a time. No, oh, okay. You operate in a giant scale for the remainder of the current conflict. Following that, the giant gains control. Right, so you can finish the fight, and mm-hmm. then the bones disappear, and you're standing there, but the giant's in charge. Uh, The giant will use this time to indulge their worldly desire aspect to the extreme. People will take note of this indulgence. (laughs) Uh, You recover out of control when the giant has indulged in a way that makes life difficult in the holdfast or among your companions. Then you mark the abomination condition. Oh, boy. Yep. You can mark that condition to to replenish all your boxes or recover out of control. Yeah. Uh, You are shunned. Merchants will not sell to you. The meat hall will not have you present. You must perform a selfless or heroic act for another person without involving your giant or its bones. Interesting. And and then you're no longer an abomination. Wow. Yep. So avoid that if you can. (laughs) Or don't. (laughs) Or don't. Lean into it. Uh. (laughs) All right. And then Amelia. Yes. Would you read your runescribed conditions? So the first one is using your rune at heroic scale. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, the second one is using your rune at a cost. Uh, what are the names of those? Of the conditions themselves. Oh, it's I'm sorry. The, on, um, it's on the line above there. Yeah. Gotcha. Runic power is the first one. So that's using your rune at a heroic scale. Um, rune bound, using your rune at a cost. And ruptured, you're mm-hmm. overtaken by the power, by your rune's power. Yes. So, um, runic power, you mark the box, you. Uh, channel the power of your rune into any approach that you use. So whatever you are doing, you just do it at a higher, a higher level. You can, it's always evident and noticeable, uh, unless you have a stunt that says it's not, because that is an option. Cool. You recover boxes, uh, basically by, uh, meditating, right? On focusing on yourself and who you are and not your runic power. Okay. Cool. Uh, if, uh, all of your boxes of runic power are marked and you still wish to channel your rune, you can mark two stress boxes to do it. If you do this, you also mark rune burned. Uh, rune burned means that you have your use of runic power has left a mark upon you. Uh, you write a new aspect to reflect this change in your physical or mental state, and you have to make an overcome roll of plus six to get rid of it. Oof. Um, that's a lot. The yeah. usual difficulty for things in this game is two. Yeah. <laughs> yep. yep. If you are taken out of a conflict while rune burned is marked, your rune stops you being killed. However, <laughs> <laughs> your rune replaces one of your six core approaches. Ooh. Wow. So if you took the rune of ice, for example, <laughs> and this happened, you would replace, oh, let's say haste with the rune Isa. And every time you wanted to use or needed to use haste, you have to use the rune instead. Oh, man. Wow. Including marking the condition boxes to do so. Oh, that gets out of control really fast. Uh Uh Uh-huh. Because if this keeps happening, you replace your other approaches, too. You just gotta slow down. Slow down. You'll be fine. If all six (laughs) approaches get taken over by your rune, you rupture. Yeah. You, you, You just explode in a burst of... Uh, runic power, and then you replace your rune scribe destiny with either the ghost or the draugr. Oh, that's that. That's yeah. <laughs> yeah, you basically become an NPC, but those are threat destinies that I wrote that are at the back of the book. Nice. So you you either become a vengeful zombie or a a ghost with unfinished business. Oh, that's amazing. That's all I ever wanted, really. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, let's be honest. Who wouldn't want that? Right. Uh-huh. So then I'm going to be the seer. Um, I have uh, three boxes of seer magic. I can create pervasive effects with them. I have a condition called a word in the right ear. Um, Authority listens. Society distrusts you. I have three boxes of mistrusted, where people look sideways at me. And one box of shunned, where I am outcast. So with Seer Magic, I roll against a set difficulty, and I create an advantage that has extra invocations, extra fate points on it. It always gives you bonus uh, invocations, even if you fail or succeed at a cost. Mm -hmm. But I have to mark a box of Indebted, which is a condition track that everyone has, and I have to name which otherworldly being I owe a debt to. 
or I mark a box of, of mistrusted because society sees me manipulating the strands of fate. And they're like, that's, that's weird. You mm-hmm. need to stop doing that. <laughs> if I mark a word in the right ear, I have my advice heeded by someone in a position of power. Basically, and the, the, this is old text on these character sheets. It's basically like the wish spell in D&D. Mm. They'll do whatever I say to do as literally as I say it. Wow. And then I mark a box of mistrusted because everyone's like, I just saw you tell the Jarl to do that. Mm-hmm. No, I think you were thinking of somebody else. Mm-hmm. That wasn't me. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. I can clear boxes of mistrusted by performing altruistic acts around me without using magic. Uh, they're the similar kinds of deed, deeds needed to clear your indebted track. So it has to be like a significant thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then if I am shunned, uh, I'm no longer allowed to take part in the society of my holdfast. Oh, and by the way, mistrusted, for every box that's marked, all my social interactions increase by difficulty of one per box marked. Oh, boy. Yeah. Because people are, there's just an aura I'm giving off. <laughs> yeah. And then I can only clear shun by operating alone or at the fringes of society until the end of the next session. Ooh, so wow. I have at least a full session of play where I am shunned. Wow. Regardless of, of anything. Mm-hmm. And even if my mistrusted track is clear, people treat me as if it is full. Wow. Yep. <laughs> I love how quickly things go bad in this game. Uh-huh. Like, uh, I, and that's like, I remember that in our game too, that it was like by the end, like everything, like burn it to the ground. <laughs> like, <laughs> and so in convention sessions and one shots, they tend to burn a lot faster mm-hmm. because I mean, what are you going to do? Right. There, there are no real, it, no real consequences. Like right. The There's no reason be to over like save up on. those things. Mm-hmm. Exactly. So people used all their resources in longer play where you don't have to be pedal to the metal the whole time. You can manage all of these things. Mm-hmm. Right. And it's the GM's job to make sure that you are in a position where managing them might be difficult or at least interesting. Mm-hmm. But as a rune scribed, like, if there's no conflict happening, like there's not a big battle scene, you don't necessarily have to use your rune. Right. So you can go a whole session without even coming near it. Mm-hmm. But that might not be the case. Like you might end up in a big battle and then that transitions to a chase. Those are two separate kinds of scenes. Mm-hmm. The next mm-hmm. one, the second scene would require you to mark a box. Right. Oh, Again. Yeah. So things can escalate and you have to be aware of the circumstances that you're in. Mm-hmm. So anyway, um, those are our archetypes. And to begin fleshing out who the people inside of these archetypes are, we do our aspects. Uh, so the first thing we will each come up with is our high concept aspect. This is the thing that is the most true about you. It is a short descriptive phrase. You can think about who this person is, what they want, what they do day in, day out. And this can tie directly in to their destiny. Or it can just be who they are as a person, ir- irrespective of the fact that, that you now have a bone bond, right? Or you're branded with a rune. So, and if you are um, not great at putting things into aspect terms, it's one of my superpowers. All right. <laughs> I love aspects. So we can talk about who the person is, and then we can come up with a, a, an evocative aspect for it. Okay. So um, Ryan or Amelia, it doesn't matter. Um who would like to go first? Who has an idea of who their character is? I, I have a little bit of something. Do it. Okay. So um, who's, who's your character, Ryan? Okay. Um, so I was trying to put it into aspect uh, phrasing, mm-hmm. even though I've never done that before. Sure. I believe um, in you. Uh, I do too. So the, the phrase that I came up with was, uh, we'll do whatever it takes to protect their family. Okay. Ryan, you know how to make aspects. Sweet. Yep. So I'm uh, writing that in on our slide here. Cool. That's your high concept. Fantastic. Excellent. It is. It can be as simple as that. Nice. Uh, Amelia, Oof. do you have thoughts? Mm-mm. Um, <laughs> <laughs> nope. No thoughts ever. Nope. None. Nope. I, I'm I'm dead now. Uh, <laughs> okay, so you have you to either the take the Draugr or the or yeah. <laughs> the Draugr or the Ghost Destiny. Um, okay, we'll turn to page uh, one hundred and no, right. <laughs> Start over. Um, <laughs> well, you know, uh, I want to play an Amelia character, uh-huh. so I'm thinking 
something like temperamental or like um hmm. can i suggest a connection for your character that would make things interesting where we're going to play this absolutely please do okay i'll take a small step back uh what is the gender of this character you're going to play oh that's a good question Usually we save that for the names, but it's important here. Um, yeah, I think that we are going to say non-binary. Okay. So would you like to be the hot-headed child of the Jarl? I would love that. Okay. Um, <laughs> do you want to take it a step further and be the eldest? Uh, yes. Hot-headed eldest child of the Jarl. Because I don't know anything about being a hot-headed eldest child in my real life at all. <laughs> yeah, me either. <laughs> um. The reason that's that's interesting, and this is this is sort of spelled out in the book. Um, if you have a rune, you are basically like your warrior clan's beating stick. Like rune scribes were the most directly powerful thing around until the bone bonda came along. <laughs> uh, if you have a rune, you can't lead. Oh no. Oof. Yeah, because someone in a leadership position and a hold fast with that much power is very dangerous. There was mm -hmm. a time when that did happen, and by like mutual accord across a continent everyone sort of agreed we're not doing that anymore yeah oh that bad huh um <laughs> yeah pretty much like yeah yeah all right so That's uh amazing. cool and then um for my sears high concept let's see um i'm gonna say it is absolute power absolutely <laughs> we're gonna get along fine <laughs> Ryan is so sweet, as usual. <laughs> cool. So, and this is where, like, one of my favorite things about fate comes into play, uh, because the high concept is sort of what the world sees a lot of the time, or it's what it's what drives your character. But then you have a trouble that always gets in your way, and it usually complements or contrasts your high concept. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people when they're making uh, aspects for a character for the first time, they shove the high concept and the trouble together as one thing, and we have to tease it out. Um, for example, if you, Amelia, had said, not only is this person hot-headed, but they just have a raging inferno of a temper, right? Mm -hmm. I would have backed that out and said, okay, well, then your high concept is eldest child of the Jarl, and your trouble is hot-headed. Mm -hmm. But you get to be even more interesting now because being hot head isn't what always gets you in trouble. Something else is. Right. Yeah. So uh, if either of you have a trouble that uh, you've been noodling on, feel free. I want to say power hungry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> power hungry, hot head, oh. child of the Earl. <laughs> what a fun combo. Uh huh. <laughs> Nothing could go wrong here. Nothing. No. In a, right. in a, what are you thinking? Yeah. Uh, let's see. So what always gets me into trouble? Mm -hmm. And what was your high concept? Uh, we'll do whatever it takes to protect my family. Mm. Can I suggest something? Yeah, please. Um, I want to say perhaps like easily influenced. I, w I was thinking something similar because you mentioned that you were one of the new crop of bone bonded. Yeah, I wanted to be part of the, the new five. Right, and I the fab five. Yeah, hey. <laughs> <laughs> Things just keep getting better. Uh -huh. um, I uh, I assumed that you you made that choice to protect your family. Yes. Right. So to 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 dovetail with what Emilia was saying, um, something similar could be uh, poor long term decision making skills. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I yeah I like that. Uh, lives in the moment or something like that. Lives in the moment is a really good, good combination of both of those things, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because living in the moment is often something we aspire to. But if you don't think about moments after that moment. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. I like that. Cool. Uh, my trouble is going to be I have no idea what I'm doing. Uh oh <laughs> Oh, yes. <laughs> hey, that rock looks good to move in the yeah, past. Be be <laughs> because I have this power. And it feels amazing. I feel like I'm a new seer. Like mm -hmm. I'm not, I've not been doing this for a while. So like I'm already way in over my head. Mm -hmm. You fake cool. it till you make it. Yeah. 
<laughs> um, all right. So the third aspect in most fake games, the rest of the aspects are not typed like this. Mm -hmm. But as I mentioned, I found it a lot easier for rapid character creation to have it be this way. So two of the three of us get to choose our warrior clan. Mm -hmm. Ryan, I hate to break it to you, but when you took your bone bod, you broke your vow to your warrior clan. Aww. So mm -hmm. instead of writing a clan aspect, you have to write a giant's bond aspect. Okay. This is an aspect that describes your relationship with the dead giant that lives in your head. Hmm. So while you ponder that, because that leads into you making your giant as oh. well, which we'll, we'll shoot off and do that after this. Mm -hmm. um, Amelia, you and I get to choose warrior clans. All right. The nine warrior clans I listed before, but they all have aspects associated with them. You can use that aspect whole cloth, or you can make your own to describe your relationship with the clan. Uh, so we'll give a, we'll give another rundown here of the nine. Uh, it's page forty in the PDF if you wish to follow along. So, um, clan of the bear, the beast must be bested, is their aspect. Clan of the dragon, rage is all the warmth we need. Clan of the hammer. The world is meant to be shaped. Clan of the horse, one with the wind, one with the land. Clan of the ox, we stand, we fight. Clan of the raven, there are worlds beyond what we can see. Clan of the snake, hide, wait, strike, bite. Clan of the sparrow, words are the true weapon. And the clan of the wolf, the pack is all. So who are you? I think I am going to go with clan of the dragon. Who are in lots of trouble. <laughs> that one seems a natural fit. Are you going to go with just the straight up aspect there? I think so. That's amazing. Um, in the uh, in War of Metal and Bone, the uh, clans were not in alphabetical order um, the way they are now. And Dragon was the last in the list. So invariably, I would re be reading off all these aspects and I would read Dragon and the whole table will go, oh. <laughs> <laughs> Because it's it's my favorite of the clan aspects. Yeah, I like it. I am going to make my character not totally unredeemable. <laughs> I mean, and, I guess. <laughs> and I'm going to go with Clan of the Wolf. Right. The pack is all. Do I have to choose my previous clan? It is a useful bit of information to know, but there's not really any place to note it down. Mm -hmm. So, what's your relationship like with this dead giant that always lives in your head? I, I kind of wanted to make it um, a little bit troublesome for family life. Oh, okay. um, Because family is the most important thing to me. My thought would be like a romantic connection. Okay. You want to know what's really cool? What's that? You this are game. the first person in five years of me running this ever to suggest a romantic relationship with their giant. Oh, interesting. Yeah. I'm so here for this. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do a lot of shipping <laughs> there, in, in totally my fair. head. Um, so, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, so just something like Forbidden Love? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm going to change this on your little entry on our sheet here to read Giant's Bond. And... And part of the reason that's so interesting in fiction is because if you've read Norse mythology, mm -hmm. like giants and gods are kind of interchangeable yeah. in a lot of ways. Like giants are really powerful. And for one of them that has been locked in their eternal slumber to be pulled back to the world and bound to a mortal is usually a huge affront. Yeah. And you and your giant are in love with each other. Yeah. <laughs> I think I just got a goosebump. Awesome. Like, this is really good. <laughs> this is really good. Amazing. Uh, you could probably blame uh, our last character evolution cast episode um, uh, all about romance. Yeah. Oh, well, you got well, romance you go. on the brain. <laughs> yep. Fair enough. Um, and I want to say, uh, just for our sake of the story, uh, I used to be part of Clan of the Wolf. Okay. Uh, I like that. Which, that's a that's a that's a nice tie together, yeah. um, and that's the kind of thing that like it's not explicitly spelled out, but I think it's easy enough to see that the fiction leads to those kinds of connections, mm -hmm. right? Because it's just more interesting for that to be the case. Yeah, 
Mm-hmm. Uh, so we'll take a quick digression, Ryan. Let's make your giant. Yes. So the spot for that is on the third page of your character sheet. Um, we'll save the name for last because names are hard. Mm-hmm. Um, and we need a high concept for your giant. Okay. Um, as well, just because I think it provides context, not because it matters as a discrete thing. Mm-hmm. What is the gender of your character and what is the gender of your giant? I'm going to say that the gender of my character is male mm-hmm. uh, and the gender of the uh, giant is female. Okay. Um, as a quick sidebar, uh, gender neutrality, you know, homosexuality, mm-hmm. it's all fair game in this version of Midgard. There's yeah. no discrimination on those fronts. Well, you know what? At all. No, I'm going to change it. Um, okay. Because I wanted um, to have a family, of course. Uh-huh. Um, so procreation and all that sort of fun stuff. I wanted to have kids to up the stakes even more. Mm-hmm. Um, so I was thinking, well, got to have uh, the correct parts mm-hmm. to do so. So I was thinking man, woman. But I want to be creating a female character, I think. Okay. And I want her to be the mother of oh. uh, her children. And uh-huh. I want her to be in love with this giant who is also female. Okay. So so your character, just to, again, to explore a little backstory and provide context, you were expecting to have a uh, biologically born male partner mm-hmm. at some point in time in your life. Yes. To uh, allow you to bear children. Yes. And either while that process was happening... Or before it could happen, Mm -hmm. you took this bone bond, and now you are in love with a female presenting giant. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think uh, I have an an established family, and now I'm torn between my husband and my giant. Okay, wonderful. Um, What is your giant's high concept? How does she view the world? How does she interact with it? Hmm. I gotta think like a giant. Um. Another thing that may help provide this context specifically for your character, mm-hmm. why did your character fall in love with her? I'm going to say it was because she also has a very strong, like, she has protective a protective instinct. Yeah, a very protective instinct, uh, specifically uh, surrounding the concept of family. Okay. So something that is speaks to that con- to, to that instinct but is general enough to be interesting might be something like keep them close keep them safe yeah yeah i like that okay all right and what is your giant's worldly desire what is the thing that she misses the most about having a physical body and having conscious thought <laughs> mm-hmm. hmm that's well, a family uh family friendly podcast uh-huh, uh-huh. <laughs> so let's see um, one of the options I was thinking, um, a very, um, cardinal knowledge sort of, uh, a lover's touch. Yeah. I, th- I think that would probably be a good description of what I was thinking. Because that makes it very interesting if the giant takes over and your character is back home with her husband. Uh huh. Do, 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 do. Lines and veils. Um, <laughs> Uh, and then the last thing for Which your Which I should giant. say, are you, you're you okay with all of this? Me? Yeah. Oh, Which, 100%. Which while we're here. Okay. Just checking in. One one thousand mm-hmm. percent. If <laughs> okay. this were not a family-friendly podcast, we could discuss this in more detail. Uh-huh. But yeah. Well, it is. That wasn't my not. choice. <laughs> yeah. Fair enough. Um, for my part, I should say. I don't wish to speak for anyone else. Yeah. Um, <laughs> The last thing that you need to do is you need to pick a special approach that is just your giants and that is used only when the bones are summoned. So like flair and haste and focus and guile, it's a way the giant does things in the world, but it's only hers. So this is just, it could be anything. Yeah. It's just a manner of, of acting in the world. Oh, interesting. Okay. Um, so, so if it answers the question, how do you do this? Yeah. That's the sort of thing. Um, compassion. Wonderful. And if you were to use that in play, you would roll that at plus three, which is as high as your highest approach as a human. Nice. Um, and then we just need a name 
for your mm-hmm. giant. How many syllables do you want it to have if you're not thinking of anything already? <laughs> um, I was thinking uh, something s- somewhat short, like two, okay. two syllables maybe. Okay. Um, giant names in my head tend to be much harder, mm-hmm. lo- lots of consonantal sounds. Yeah. Um, so uh, something like uh, Rivka. Or Felder is what comes to my mind. Mm-hmm. But this is your giant. How about um kind of I like a little bit of Felder, but how about Feldra? Feldra. Excellent. Okay. We know who your giant is. Nice. I love it. All right. Next up, we have we all have another aspect to do. Mm-hmm. We have a sacred item. Um, much like we focused on the bone bonded for, or the giant for, uh, Ryan's, uh, giant's bond, uh, for your rune scribed, Amelia, mm-hmm. your sacred item is your rune. All right. So we have two important things to discover. Mm-hmm. The first is which rune did you choose? Uh, well, you know, um. <laughs> Oh, wait, 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 wait. Can I take a guess? <laughs> yes, please. Is it, it's one of two mm-hmm. in my mind. It's either Hagalaz or Thurasaz. It's Thurisaz. Destruction and change. <laughs> surprise, surprise. I know. Yep. I love and that you've listened to enough of the show to know that. <laughs> uh, well, I also see the other aspects on this character. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's true. You can so, put two and two together. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> and the other question, which will help us craft the aspect itself, is um, how is it marked upon your body? Um. So, like, how did it get there, or... What does it look like now? Or how did it get there? Was it tattooed, branded, frostbitten? Is there metal embedded into your body? Um, Do you have a birthmark in its shape? I mean, literally oh. any physical thing you can think of. I that... think that it is metal. Um, But okay. I think that it looks like it's still, like, hot from the forge. Like, it okay. glows, like, red, orange, you know. It has mm-hmm. like a fiery glow to it. Uh, so you have uh, a newly forged rune of Thurisaz. Mm-hmm. Uh, and just for context, and because it's fun to know, um, how big is it and where is it located? Um, I think it is, um, it takes up like most of the forearm. Awesome. So in the place where your like arm cuff of loyalty to the Jarl would be, you've oh. got this rune. Yeah. Nice. Okay, I like it. Um, <laughs> and the way you said, okay, like, yeah, I can see your GM wheels turning. Uh huh. Oh yeah, uh-huh. for sure. Um, <laughs> uh, for for the rest of us, Ryan, um, mm-hmm. the sacred item is a noun phrase that's important to your character. Mm-hmm. So it can be a physical object. It mm-hmm. can be something ephemeral. Uh, so like my grandfather's axe or my mother's sage advice, you know, are all valid. Okay. So what do you think? What is sacred to your character? Hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. (laughs) I can tell you what mine is if you want a little time to think. Yeah, please. Uh, So mechanically, there's a thing that we'll get to next in the the stunts that we take uh, that the seer can take that is pretty important if you want your seer to uh, do well at ritual magic and not constantly be owing debts or being mistrusted. Mm -hmm. And, And that is a ritual staff. So uh, my sacred item is an iron banded stone staff. So it looks like uh, Donatello's bow staff from the TMNT cartoon back in the late 80s, right? It has things on either end, but it's made of stone. I can barely lift it. Oh, wow. Um, I I have a hard time moving around with it at all, Uh, but it gives me access to power I would otherwise not have. Mm -hmm. I'm going to say that my character's... Um, sacred item is a locket with a depiction of her mother in it, who's no longer with us. So a locket with, uh, your mother's likeness. Yeah. Okay. Wonderful. What's the locket made out of? Um, I'm going to say silver. Okay. Then, uh, we will say silver just cause it's a nice detail. Yeah. All right. 
before we get to the last aspect, we drop into some more mechanical stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, so the next thing that we do for each of our uh, characters here is we rate our approaches. Um, we simply put the numbers in the boxes that are on the, the fillable character sheets there. You get to rate one approach, one appro- approach, one approach. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you get to rate one approach at plus three. Two of them get rated at plus two, two at plus one, and one at zero. Uh, and for the destinies that you two chose, there aren't like specific approaches that necessarily uh, do better. But if you want some guidance, you can look at the stunts uh, that you already have down at the bottom of your sheet. Mm-hmm. Uh, or you can look at the stunts the optional stunts that are on the first page of your sheet and see if any of them use a particular approach and then, you know, like put those a little bit higher if you need to. Uh, but I don't think the bone bonded and the rune scribed have much of that. Mm-hmm. Uh, the seer very much does. So the optional approach or actually the, the seer magic that I use uh, uses focus so it makes almost no sense for a seer to choose anything but focus at plus three. However, I have no idea what I'm doing. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to put my focus at, we won't be ridiculous, I'll put it at plus two. Hmm, interesting. Okay. And whenever you've got your approaches set, we can just run down what each of us have chosen. I have mine. As do I. And Ryan, as usual, is absolutely... I'm trying to, I'm trying to figure out which one I'm missing. So I'm I'm writing them down in uh, plus three to zero order. And so they're out of order compared to the sheet. Right. Um, Focus. Uh, Oh, focus. Okay. My focus is going to be zero. (laughs) Mine do. (laughs) It's fine. (laughs) Okay. I've got mine. All right. Do you want to start then? Since that's the order we've been. Sure. Um, So I've got my flare. My flare is plus one. Uh, My focus is zero. My force is plus two. My guile is plus three. Cool. Haste is plus one. And intellect is plus two. All right. Yeah. Amelia. So, yeah. Oh, sorry. I was going to say, I, I was thinking she's kind of, um, I, I'm not, not sneaky, but. Um, cautious. Cautious and a uh, mm-hmm. little deceptive Ooh. at times. Maybe even self-deceptive. Mm-hmm. Ooh. <laughs> We're making problems all over the place. Uh-huh. This is fine. The, the 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 game leads you to do that. It does. I intentional design. Yes. <laughs> we don't have to worry about it. I know there are no consequences here. All right. Flare, I put plus 3, force at plus 2. Um I did guile also at plus 2. Um and then for plus one, I did intellect and haste. Mm-hmm. And then I did zero focus. Mm-hmm. Just like me in real life. <laughs> uh, I put my guile at plus three. Uh, but unlike uh, my bone bonded companion, I'm just sneaky. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, my focus and my haste are plus two. My flair and my intellect are plus one. And my force is plus zero. Nice. That's why you can't lift that staff. That's exactly yep. right. <laughs> um, the next step is choosing stunts. Uh, and I should say as a side note, uh, there is a, an optional thing in pretty much every fate game that y- your stats and your stunts, aside from the ones that you automatically start with, can be discovered in play. Mm. So if you don't want to take the time to put down all your approaches, it's a little bit easier in Accelerated because Fate Core has uh, two, three, six, ten skills you fill okay. in. You can leave those blank and you can just start playing. And as the character comes to you through play, you can be like, oh, well, I'm definitely good at this. And you can fill it in. Mm. And same for stunts. You can uh, decide you keep your course, you have your core stunts in this in fate core and fate accelerated outside of Ironetta. You don't start with any stunts by default. Mm -hmm. You still have to pick one. So, uh, deciding whether or not to spend refresh on stunts can happen as you discover who the character is. 
Um, I sometimes do that in convention games. I'll, I'll wait until someone is like, well, hey, I really want to be able to do a thing like this. Mm-hmm. And we'll either pick a stunt from the list or we'll, we'll write one <laughs> like on, on the spot. Um, right. Yeah. Uh, so who would like to go over their stunts first? I'm trying to read mine. So I can... The ones that are attached to our characters already? Yeah the, one, yeah. the ones that are in that stunts box, those are your core stunts. Awesome. Um, and in Ironhead Accelerated, core stunts mean they are either intrinsic to what the destiny is, mm-hmm. or they interact with your conditions in very specific ways. Okay. So uh, my two stunts are giant presence. Uh, because of the giant residing inside me, I am able to channel its might through my voice. I get plus two to create advantages using force when you speak with the strength of your giant. Mm -hmm. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, And then knowledge of the ages. Your giant knows much. So I gain plus two when you use guile to overcome an obstacle involving esoteric or ancient knowledge. Um, And it can only be used for uncommon knowledge. So your giant doesn't care about the people of your holdfast, but instead holds on to deep secrets from a forgotten time. That's pretty sweet. (laughs) Awesome. Amelia, Should what I go you... over mine? Yeah, go for it. All right. So I have runic boost. You can spend a fate point and mark rune burned to channel additional power into your rune, allowing it to function at an epic scale for an exchange. If rune burned is already marked, you can do this, but you immediately mark the ruptured condition after taking your action. Mm-hmm. So that's uh, not great. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> nope. You go pop. <laughs> yes. But like, it looks super cool. So, mm-hmm. um, and then the other one is better to burn out. As you are driven by the power of the rune you possess, you get a plus two to overcome when you use your runic approach. You must mark the appropriate conditions to use the approach as normal. Yep. So there, there are things that incentivize you to use your rune. Who knew? Yep. <laughs> hmm. It's like this game wants me to get in trouble. Uh, and then by default, the seer gets uh, intervention. Uh, once per session, if a character is about to die, either uh, due to the narrative or due to be taken out, taken out while their doomed condition is marked, or if the rune scribe, for example, was going to rupture, I, get, I can save them. I just stop them dying. Mm. Uh, I mark a box of mistrusted. If, they, if that is full, I can mark indebted instead. If indebted is filled... Uh, I can default on two debts to clear that track and then mark a box. It saves the character's life. It, all their conditions and stress uh, are cleared. If they are grateful for the intervention, uh, they mark two boxes of indebted to me to represent the debt they owe me. Uh, if they are not con- not grateful, there is a condition uh, they get called broken fate. And what broken fate means is that you were supposed to die when you were going out. And I stopped that from happening. You choose a different destiny. Oof. Wow. So this is the kind of thing that there would be some some discussion from a meta standpoint at the table as to whether or not the player wanted to see that happen to their character. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But if the rune scribe ruptured and I stopped it and you were like, no, I was going to go out in this blaze of glory. And as also the I want to be a ghost. Uh-huh. So. As, as the character, you would then not be rune scribed anymore. You pick a different destiny. Wow. Yeah. That's um, interesting. But now I can be Jarl. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and in either case, if the character who is saved has a destiny, they may choose to change it. Spending advancements is normal. So even if you're grateful, you can switch it up. Mm-hmm. So there's a positive and negative reason to do so. Um, and then I have fate led me here. Because fate guides my actions once per, once per scene, I can spend a fate point to show up wherever I want. Right. Love it. Yep. Always um, useful. Yeah. Um, then we get to choose uh, additional stunts if we want to. And mm-hmm. those are on uh, on the first page here. Uh, I am going to check my own rules real quick and make sure that I'm not misquoting this because this has changed uh, a little bit. Um, that is under chapter four, characters, high concept, aspects, trouble. Uh, <laughs> approach stunts, there we go. Um, yeah, so you get one additional stunt, uh, from your destiny for free. So you get to pick one off the first page for free. Oh, wow. 
Um, and then you can spend up to three refresh to take three additional stunts. Okay. But that lowers the number of fate points you would start the game with by that number. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Okay. I know there's one that I absolutely need to take. Which one is that? Dwarven Connections. Okay. Your giant grants you knowledge of their twisted descendants, the dwarves. You are able to speak their language and read their runes. Um, so for some setting uh, background, uh, and that's really cool. I'm glad you took that one. Mm -hmm. Giants existed in the world. Some giants fell in love with trees. And as time went on, they grew smaller in stature to reflect their adoration of these trees. Those giants came to be called elves. Oh. Some elves began to dig into the ground and found a love of dark places and the forging of things. Those elves became dwarves. Hmm. Fast forward to now, and Loki has been dripping poison in the dwarves' ears, telling them that they should reclaim their lost giant heritage. They deserve more than the tunnels they've been crawling around in. So they make giant mechs and start Ragnarok. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's amazing. Yeah. What else, so what else sounds good to you? Is there any refresh you want to spend there? Um, so Dwarven Connections for sure. I was thinking... There was a couple of them I was uh, kind of looking between. Um, Next to the Gods in Power and the Reth the Restlessness of the Dead. Mm -hmm. um, I think I'm going to go with... Um, oh, man. Both of those could be so interesting in different uh, scenarios. I think I'm going to go with uh, the, re the Restlessness of the Dead. Um, okay. So this basically means that I, I don't need sleep like a normal mortal would. So I can go off for a week without sleep. And if I were to push beyond that, I can mark in peril uh, condition for another week of sleeplessness. If I push beyond <laughs> that, I can gain one additional week. And at the end of the third week, mark out of control and the giant takes over. So mm -hmm. what I was kind of thinking with this one is that gives me more time uh, with the giant. For your escapades? Mm, that is heartbreakingly sad. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> oh, of all the reasonings that I expected to hear of Oh, someone, really? That's like exactly what I thought he was going to do. <laughs> oh, you know him far better than I do in my heart. <laughs> <laughs> Ryan, how can I punch you in the feels? I know. Oh, that's good. That's really, really good. Um, so then you mark your refresh down to three, and yep. you would start every uh, session with three fate points. Yes. Uh, and for those listening, there are other stunts. It would take too long to read them all out. Uh, so you can check out the show notes uh, where these uh, sheets, I think, are going to appear if I'm right about that. Uh, yeah, if we if we can actually get to it. <laughs> yeah, we always yeah. try to like put our – and then sometimes I get tired of writing in. 800 skills on things and then i don't do it <laughs> just, these just ones are easy the though pdfs and uh -huh. a dropbox link yep i think that'll work well <laughs> it's a lot easier mm -hmm. um cool uh what looks good to you amelia you get to pick one for free and you can pick up to three more if you want to spend that refresh um so do i have hang about let me check my book i, I see that I you don't like have many on that sheet two there. right uh let me make sure i believe because I think we're looking at a playtest sheet here. Okay. And there are others that you have available to yourself. There kind of have to be. Otherwise, there's no reason for you to spend that refresh. Mm -hmm. And I seem to remember. Oh, yeah. You totally have more. Uh, you can look at page 78 of the, of the core PDF. Um, okay. You have... Um, no, I actually didn't give the rune scribed enough stunts. Huh. You only have... Uh, you have three more you can take total, uh, but that would only you get one for free and you can take the other two. So you don't have you don't have enough. I don't think that's the first bit of extra content I'm going to have to write. OK, oh, there you go. <laughs> There's always something. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, if I can get the page to show because my computer's being slow. Oh. Um, I am pretty sure that I don't want I live to serve. OK, because that just doesn't sound like me. Right. <laughs> um, I do like runic recovery, uh, 
because that makes a lot my of sense for you. Focus is terrible. Uh, so, you know, that makes sense. Um, where did I? Sorry, what page did you say? Eighty. What? Uh, seventy-eight. Seventy-eight. I can. Uh, well, and the third one is is simple. It's subtle rune. Um, when runic power is marked, you can spend a fate point to have the effects of your runic power concealed for the rest of the scene. Oh. So, like, instead of punching something and having your rune disintegrate it, you could just gently lay your hand on someone's shoulder and melt them. I like that. that yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Uh, so you also have subtle rune. All right. Cool. Uh, then for the seer, I'm going to take ritual staff. Uh, it gives me a plus two to create advantage rolls with focus, which means that um, when I'm rolling to do my seer power stuff, I roll at plus five instead of plus three because the difficulty is a static four. So it gives me a better chance of succeeding without a cost. Nice. I'm also going to take <laughs> um, this is one I think actually Amelia I believe this one happened during your game at a catacon mm -hmm. and I was like I have to make that an actual thing because it was just oh. something this year decided to do I'm going to take fate's lost children uh, once per session I could spend a fate point to call upon the dishonored dead who tried to hide from their own destinies I create an advantage with one invocation to represent these Draugr. If they attack, treat them as a single Draugr, see page, blah, blah, blah. If I do this in a manner that is visible or anyone discovers me, I microbox and mistrusted. I love it. Yeah, because uh, I'm way in over my head. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. and, and the others don't like seem to do a whole lot for this particular character. Mm -hmm. uh, they, just yeah. don't, they just don't fit with the archetype or th with the stuff I've got going. So I'm down to three refresh. Um, we're all down to three refresh. No, yeah, we, uh, yeah, we all are. Yep. Cool. Uh, then we have uh, one last thing to do, and these characters are complete for play. All right. Um, well, sorry, two last things. Before we do the last one thing, of them we, have is to, naming we, them. Have to, we have to give our characters names. Yes. <sighs> okay. I knew this was coming, Amelia. All right. I've been doing my homework. So <laughs> um, there is actually a resource uh, in the book, uh, and I can just tell it to you here, but there's a link to it in the text. You can go to nordicnames.de, and it will give you uh, a whole list of, of names by Norse-like mm. island. So Danish, Faroese, Finnish, so on and so forth. Um on the left-hand side, if you go down to more Nordic names, you can click on Viking names, uh, Old Norse by names, like there's a lot going on. Mm. Then it lets you choose names by uh, by gender. Uh, let's see how to, three how to find Viking names on this website. Oh yeah, there we go. Old Norse names. Uh, they don't have a a link directly to it for some reason. I will drop it in this chat. Um, I, I used to it. just use Icelandic. Uh, because Icelandic as a language is as close to Old Norse as we can get right now. Mm -hmm. um, but they added uh, Old Norse names. So you can pick your first name using that. And the way surnames are constructed, uh, it's one of two options. It's either uh, a way to honor a parent, like your parent's name and then your gender. So it's um, if your father's name was, was Thor... And you wanted to honor them, you would be blah name Thor's son or Thor's daughter or Thor's bairn if you're gender neutral. Or you can do like the Tolkien thing and you could be like Longstrider, right? Something that describes a deed uh, because Tolkien ripped off Norse myth like, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> um, fun fact, the dwarf names in The Hobbit, all 12 of them, mm -hmm. are from the... Uh, Norse Eddas, the, the prose and poetic Eddas. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. I can't say any of these. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if you see the uh, the character that looks kind of like a D but slanted to the sideways and has the little stick through the top of it, mm -hmm. that pronounce that like a D. Okay. Um, that's what Odin would be spelled with, right? Oh, yep. And if you see the um, character that looks like a lowercase p, but the bulge is moved to the middle, mm -hmm. um, that's a th sound, a th. Mm. 
think I'm going to go with uh, Sefa. And because you are honoring your mother with that locket, mm-hmm. uh, it would not surprise me if you use her name as your surname. 100%. Okay. So what's your mother's name? Man, I got to make two names. Uh, I know. This is... I ain't about it. <laughs> um, how about Bridget? Bridget. Hmm. You would then be Seppa Bridget's daughter. Yes. Um, I like that. And let's see for mine. Oh, let's just let's let's give some uh some uh some legacy to this character. Um, so I'm going to be Lothar Loki's Baron. Oh. Oh. No one knows who my parents are, but everyone claims that I was sired by Loki. Oh man. Right. <laughs> and Baron means I am uh, gender neutral. Mm-hmm. So. So I went with uh, Brigida's daughter. Brigida? Bridget? Brigida? Yeah, that, that's great. Okay. Yep. Um, and so the ending is D-O-T-T-I-R. Is how that's spelled. D-O-T-T-I-R. Yep. How you doing, Amelia? Um, I like the name Gunleaf. G-U-N-L-E-I-F? Uh, G-U-N-N-L-E-I-F. Cool. And for your surname... Um, Typically, as the eldest, you would just be Jarl's daughter, unless you have uh, like just flouted that tradition, which is totally cool too. Um, no, we will. What was the gender neutral ending? Bar- Baron? Uh, Jarl's Jarl's Bairn, B A I R N. It just means born of. Mm-hmm. And I just can't spell <laughs> even in English. Okay. So, at the end of this process and before the very last step, we have Seta Brigida's daughter. Gunleaf Jarl's Baron and Lothar Loki's Baron. Mm-hmm. Yay. The last thing we have to do is our group aspect. Yes. All right. This is an aspect where we specifically name one of the other characters. Ooh. And it is a way to draw connections between the characters. Uh, cr- create a small shared history, whatever it might be. Mm-hmm. Um, they are unidirectional. So whoever goes first... The person they point to will connect to the third person, and the third person will connect back to the first. Okay. And people are only ever named once. Um, I didn't have that rule in the early uh, testing of War of Metal and Bone, and I would end up with, like, four characters over here and two over here. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so. I like that. Yeah. So if anyone can think of a connection that they have to another character. I've got, um, I've got one. What do you have? Um, my character would probably have a connection to your character, Tracy. Okay. Um, because we were of the same clan. Okay. So how do you feel about that? I, I still take pride in my old clan. Mm-hmm. And I still try to live by the, you know, the clan's togetherness. Mm-hmm. Um, so that still drives, drives me. Um, it has to name me specifically. Yes. Um, are you like bothered by the fact that you are now not part of this plan and this super manipulative, not great person is? I was going to say you are a constant reminder of, um, my failure to the clan. Okay. So then that would be, um, Lothar reminds me of my failure as a wolf. Does that sound good? Mm-hmm. Awesome. And how do you spell your character's name? Uh, Lothar, L-O-T-H-R. All right. Uh, and that actually makes me really happy because I was going to speak up with a connection to Gunleaf. Nice. Mm-hmm. Uh, Gunleaf, are you cool with me being the one who gave you your rune? Uh, for sure. Oh. Okay. <laughs> I gave because as if I need anything else bad for Lothar, I gave Gunleaf... Her rune. I'm sure the Yara loves that. Uh huh. It's cool. gonna go fine. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and and then Gunleaf, you need to connect it back to Seppa. Um. Let's see here. I think Seppa is someone I can use to gain power. Perfect. Ooh. That that's actually Seppa is someone I can use to gain power is great. Because you're um. A little short-sighted there, friend. Uh, <laughs> what are you talking about? This is great. We're doing great. 
<laughs> I promise it'll be better for everybody. Mm-hmm. Don't worry about it. Oh, man, we're getting in so much trouble. Oh, gosh. Mm-hmm. Our, our disaster children. Oh, gosh, what a mess. Uh, right? I love them. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then just to, to make sure that the, the digital character sheets that people are going to see are accurate here, I'm going to delete a fate point from each of our sheets. Awesome. Yeah. Did, so did we do um, it? That's it. Oh, that's oh we made people. That is we amazing. Made, we, made, we made a place and we made people. Uh-huh. Oh, man. That was so much fun. Oh my god! I love this game. And so and I know I didn't see. Did anyone check the time when we started doing the characters themselves? I did not. No. Neither did I. I was just curious as to how long that portion actually took. Um, I would wager no more than ninety minutes. Mm-hmm. No, I don't think so. Yeah, give or for, take. Yeah. For for hold fast and characters. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that was so much fun. I feel good about this. I'm just saving my character quick so I don't lose it. Oh, that's amazing. I'm I'm leaning back into my couch now that I'm not sitting up intently and <laughs> and, and 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 driving a character creation. Uh-huh. Yes. Um, I just had one quick question. I forgot what my giant's high concept was. Uh, oh, we, I have it here. Oh, sweet. Uh, your your giant. That's why we have these slides. Con- your giant's high concept was uh, keep them close, keep them safe. I love my giant. Clearly. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's the problem. Uh huh. Well, thank you so much for joining us for our Iron Ada Accelerated Character Creation episodes. Tracy, do you want to go ahead and remind people where they can find you? Uh, yeah. If you are looking for me online, you can find me just about everywhere as the other Tracy. Uh, it's all jammed together. That's T R A C Y. Uh, so the other Tracy.com. That's my Twitter handle, my Instagram. Uh, my podcast is called The Other Cast. Uh, the only exception is that uh, my Patreon is patreon.com slash Tracy Barnett. Um, I had to jockey around some account stuff there. Uh, so, so yeah, that's where you can find me. Very cool. Awesome. Thank you for joining us. And thank you to everyone for listening. And we will be back next week with our discussion episodes. Character Creation Cast is a production of the One Shot Podcast Network and can be found online at www.charactercreationcast.com. Head to the website to get more information on our hosts and guests, or even some of our character sheets. Character Creation Cast can be found on Twitter at CreationCast. I'm one of your hosts, Ryan Bolter, and I can be found on Twitter at Lord Neptune. Our other host, Amelia Antrim, can be found on Twitter at Ginger Reckoning. Music for this episode is used with a Creative Commons license or with permission from the podcast they originated from. Further information can be found within the show notes. Our main theme music is Hero Remix by Steve Combs and is used with a Creative Commons license. This podcast is owned by us under Creative Commons. This episode was edited by Ryan Bolter. Further information for the game systems used in today's guests can also be found in the show notes. If you like the systems discussed and wish to purchase them, links to the products can be found in the show notes. Also, check the notes or the website for cool stuff to go with each character, such as dice or mixtapes. Thanks for joining us, and remember, we find that the best part of any role-playing game is character creation. So go out there and create some amazing people. We will see you next time. Read some show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Character Creation Cast is hosted by the One Shot Podcast Network. If you enjoyed our show, visit oneshotpodcast.com where you'll find other great shows like The Broadswords. The Broadswords is an all woman D&D podcast focused on drama, role play, and subverting stereotypes. Join the broads as they unravel the mystery of Snowy Rashomon, a land ruled by witches and steeped in superstition. Berserkers reign and spirits roam the frozen wastes. 
Yaleris, Kila, Mipri, all have their own reasons for journeying north, but they soon find they have something in common. They are pawns in a divine plot.